This is the Thinking West Great Books Explored podcast. I'm Christian Poole. Here we dive deep into the most influential books of all time, read short essays and letters from the greatest thinkers, and discuss timeless ideas that continue to shape our culture today. Subscribe and study the great books along with us. Consider supporting us at thinkingwest.com to help keep us reading and sharing the good news of these great books. This episode is our gateway into the so-called great conversation in the great books. What they are, why read them, and what many of the greatest thinkers and writers had to say about them. And in turn, become a part of them. Now what if I told you that I could show you a way to talk with the greatest thinkers, writers, statesmen, scientists, and theologians in the history of Western civilization? That upon a whim you could hear the voice of Plato telling us what happened at the trial of Socrates. That you could converse with Aristotle on ethics, with Aquinas on the existence of God, with Machiavelli on effective politics, Adam Smith on economics, Darwin on biological sciences, or the nature of chivalry and the adventure with Cervantes. No, I'm not going to dictate to you the blueprints for some sort of advanced time machine. I would certainly not give that away so easily if I had it, but no, I'm talking about the great books. They are the sort of telephone through which we can talk across hundreds or even thousands of years with those who have laid the intellectual, literary, and scientific foundations of the Western world. Famous 16th century nobleman Michel Equiem du Montaigne wrote of the great books, quote, he shall, by reading those books, converse with the great and heroic souls of the best ages. End quote. When we take up the great books and wrestle with the ideas they present, we partake in what's called the Great Conversation, a very old 3,000-year-old conversation that's still going on today. And we might first say this is not a conversation per se, but rather us merely listening in on what these thinkers had to say. I think that's true if we only read the books but don't do anything further with them, or with the ideas in them. After all, reading is a one-way street, but a conversation re requires bi-directional traffic. While we can't literally speak with those who wrote the great books, we can engage actively with their stories, ideas, and philosophies. So, to participate in this great conversation, we need to act upon the things we read in the great books. This could be as simple as a more or less internal argument over the ideas, maybe writing our own conclusions after reading a work, or, in the best case scenario, a real discussion about the ideas with another person. That's becoming increasingly difficult these days. In a sense, this podcast is the way I'm contributing to the great conversation. Will I have anything unique to add to a 3,000-year-old conversation, spoken by men and women much more intelligent and successful than myself? I hope so, but nonetheless we become better by participating in it, to whatever small degree. Reading the great books is first and foremost an educational journey. We are exploring the ways that the Western world today physically, politically, and philosophically arose. It's a history of sorts. Nonetheless, we wrestle with many of the same ideas people have always wrestled with. And nobody, I mean not one single listener, needs a degree to read, understand, and get something out of these great books. As long as you can read at a roughly high school level, you can grapple with these works. If I can do it, certainly anyone can. And I'm not saying reading any one of the great books we'll be covering will be easy, but it will be rewarding, and it is possible. And do you know how I know anyone can do it? Because before the 1800s, school as we know it today largely didn't exist, at least for your average Joe. Most people were homeschooled, taught by family or privately tutored if they could afford it. And what was the primary teaching tool, you might ask? Well, it's these great books. It's these books that were their education. They didn't receive an education before reading them. This was their education. They read Plato, Aristotle, Plutarch, Aquinas, Bacon, Locke, you name it. Reading the great books is an education in itself. It is the foundation of a liberal education, liberal as in free thinking open to inquiry. Robert Hutchins, former president of the University of Chicago and editor-in-chief of the famous Great Books of the Western World set, of which I am a proud owner, wrote in his preface to the introductory volume, quote, 
Until lately, the West has regarded it as self-evident that the road to education lay through great books. No man was educated unless he was acquainted with the masterpieces of his tradition. There never was much doubt in anybody's mind about which the masterpieces were. They were the books that had endured and that the common voice of mankind called the finest creations in writing of the Western mind. End quote. Now, reading the great books is difficult, but you can't sharpen a knife on something soft. So to get educated, we need to read things harder than what we're used to, and those works that have survived long after their authors because of the value of the work. Long ago, during the Roman Empire, when the shadow of Greece's intellectual glory still hung over them, you weren't really considered educated, unless you knew both Latin and Greek, and with that, you could read the Greek plays, for example, in their original language. In these earlier civilizations, language was key to being educated. Most of an education was being well-versed in language, both spoken and written. Now it seems, though science is a good in and of itself, it tends to displace language to some degree, if only for the mere fact that we have too many subjects to learn now, and not enough time to learn them all. It seems that, though children are grasping the fundamentals of speaking, reading, and writing, none are gaining mastery over them as they used to. And the reason I find this troublesome, because I consider myself a victim of this same educational system, is that language is what organizes our ideas. Without language, we're mere animals, unable to think and express ideas that transcend ourselves. So our lack of mastering speaking, reading, writing, means we hence lack mastery over our ideas. Our thinking is a little more shallow. The pools of our mind are a little less deep. And as someone who has given several talks regarding the sciences, I know well that there's no benefit of doing great science if you can't communicate it. So our educations, especially early to middle formative years, should focus more intensely on mastering language, such that we can better master ideas later. Just my two cents there, again, I'm a victim of the same educational system. Some might wonder why talk so much about the West in this podcast. Why focus on just the Western world and its great books, its great conversation? Well, the short and simple answer is that I only know the West to any substantial degree. I know almost nothing about the Eastern world, in terms of its great works, thinkers, philosophies, and history. I think it's a role to be filled by someone more qualified. Not by possession of a degree in such a subject, but someone a little more in tune culturally with that side of the world. I'm a person of very European descent, mostly Greek, so naturally that's the world I've been most interested in. I'm a product, though, through no choice of my own, of the West. And perhaps it's also useful to find the West in general here, too. It's fairly loose since the East and West mixed around the edges through both conflict and trade for a very long time, even predating the oldest works we'll be talking about. So when I say the West, I'm thinking Europe, of course, the Americas, parts of Northern Africa, and parts of the Middle East. All have had easily demonstrable participation in the great books. For example, St. Augustine, author of the Confessions, was the Bishop of Numidia, part of modern-day Algeria. From the Middle East, we have the obvious influence of the Bible and Torah. And then we might ask, what is a great book in the first place? Now, there's no simple definition for what a great book is. There are many glib definitions that are given more for entertainment than actual understanding. To try to classify what is and isn't a classic book, we might first think about what properties are common to the great books. I'm sure everyone's list might be a little different, but my list consists of three things, which really, as I'll show, collapse into one thing. The first aspect of a classic book is that it's old. But why does it need to be old? I'll get to that. The second thing is that it has to be popular. But of course you'll think, why does popularity decide what books are great and which aren't? We don't apply the same to a person. A person isn't merely great because they are popular. Certainly not in high school. So far we're not getting anywhere, it seems, and just stumbling blindly in the dark. The third thing a great book is, is impactful. A great book packs a punch to the reader. It hits them hard and leaves a mark not on just them, but on many people. Enough to change a society in some way. And in light of us thinking of great books as those that have significantly impacted the thinking and philosophies of a generation or more, we find that the first two things, time and popularity, are necessary in order for our work to be impactful. It takes a few generations in order to look back at various books and decide whether it really and truly impressed any ideas on society. Most are forgotten on the wayside. 
and a book has to be popular either in its own time or any time after to reach enough people to alter the mind of a society. So there you have it. My definition of a great book is simply one that has had a significant impact on society. It's left its mark on that society. And yes, this definition is still surely subjective, but we'll return to this topic a little later on where we can try to flesh out what makes a great book in more detail. It's a podcast episode all in itself. And then you might ask, well, why should we read these great books in the first place? We've defined them as great, but who cares why read them? We read the great books to become educated. Classically educated, to be specific. Laura M. Burquist, author of Designing Your Own Classical Curriculum, which gives a guide to constructing your own classical homeschooling curriculum for your kids, writes about the intention of a classical education saying, quote, It is the ability to think that is our goal in a classical curriculum. We want our children to acquire the art of learning. It is not the number of facts they are acquainted with that measures the educational success, but what they are able to do with the facts. Whether they are able to make distinctions, to follow an argument, to make reasonable deductions from the facts, and finally, to have a right judgment about the way things are. End quote. The classical education teaches us to think, to use facts to form conclusions and convey them, rather than the mere acquisition of knowledge. The classical education emphasizes action over acquisition. While at first a classical education seems high-flying and abstract, it's actually very practical in its aims. Because what is the use of knowledge if you can't use it properly? The typical modern education is like the collection of all kinds of automobiles, trucks, sports cars, stick shifts, convertibles, etc. Where the goal is merely to acquire as many cars and then as much diversity of cars as possible in your garage. The classical education, on the other hand, collects some cars as well, but focuses on teaching you how to use those cars, how to drive them. Knowledge is only useful if we use it, or at least can use it. You might be thinking, but I enjoy reading books by other authors, even though they're not considered great books. Maybe you think that more modern books have just as much to offer as any of these older books. Maybe. You might be right. But think of it this way. In a month, how many books can you read? Let's assume most will read just one book a month, since our lives are so busy between jobs, school, kids, social media, TV, movies, podcasts, chores, etc. That means you can read just 12 books in a year. And in 10 years, you can read 120 books. Now everyone listening has a different number of years left on this earth, sad to say. Some of us have 60 or more years left in the tank. Some 40. Some 20. Some less than 10. So if you're on the upper end of the scale, you might be looking at your last 120 books. Now, I'm fairly young. I think if everything goes right, I'll live another 50 years or so. That's 600 books. That's my allowance. I've got 600 books I can put in my head, assuming I never read one twice. If I go to read all of Stephen King's books, my number drops to something around 540. Now, no offense to Mr. King, as he's an extremely prolific author, but that's 60 books I can't get back. Could I have spent this book currency better by spreading it out among many authors from different times and places to get a better value per book? I think so. You start to think a little more thrifty when you think of how many books you might have left in you. And this is how I come to reading the so-called great books. These are the books that have been passed down in a somewhat democratic way from one generation to another for possessing something special and something worth reading for future generations. So where am I going to spend the majority of my 600 books? I'm going to spend them on those that Western civilization has preserved, some more than 2,800 years like the works of Homer and the works found in the Old Testament. These are the works that have shaped the best minds in the world since the beginnings of the West. Again, it's not that Stephen King books are bad or don't contain something useful to us. They might as well join the great books in all their glory. But I'm going to play conservatively and place my literary currency with the time-tested books. Now, am I going to splurge every once in a while on a modern take on a historical event or some fun fiction novel from time to time? Of course, everyone will do that at some point. But I try to squeeze those in as bonuses in between the great books. For example, I recently read a book probably already considered a classic by many, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury, and loved it. Because to me it speaks so well to the importance of the great books, but 
all books in general, in their ability to pass on knowledge and wisdom to avoid every generation stumbling in the dark. It's also one of the few books I can say it was very difficult to actually tear myself away from. Another thing you can think about is, how much of what we read do we internalize? Do we become what we read? It seems that way from food, we tend to take on the nature of the foods we eat in some capacity. So would we rather absorb lessons from the greatest minds of all time through the great books that we know, or place our bets on letting the literary novelties of our time shape us? Francis Bacon makes this connection implied here between books and food as he distinguishes among the value offered by various books, writing, quote, Some books are to be tasted, others to be swallowed, and some few to be chewed and digested. End quote. The great books are those few that are to be chewed and digested. Now, one of the premier, though not by far the only set of great books out there, is called The Great Books of the Western World, published by Encyclopedia Britannica originally in 1952, and was the product of years of hard work from Robert Hutchins and Mortimer Adler at the University of Chicago. And the editor-in-chief Hutchins had this to say about their hard work. Quote, This is more than a set of books and more than liberal education. Great Books of the Western World is an act of piety. Here are the sources of our being. Here is our heritage. This is the West. This is its meaning for mankind. End quote. Now, two things. One, though he's specifically referencing the set of books published by Britannica, there's no doubt he had the same sentiments about the larger concept of the great books, even many of those he knowingly didn't include in the original 54-volume set. Secondly, do I think this quote might be a tad over the top? Is this set of books, quote, an act of piety? And is it in itself the meaning for mankind? No, I, I don't think so. I would caution you that although the great books are marvelous and well worth reading and spending time on, I don't think we should think of them in religious terms. Yes, many of the books are directly religious and philosophical, but the knowledge represented by these books doesn't constitute a new religion. Yes, these books, in my opinion, contain the most important things man can speak about and may inform someone's conception of the meaning of life, but it is not in itself the meaning. I think a better way to think about it is the written record of man's intellect. I was tempted to say the development or evolution, but this implies that man is always getting better or more correct philosophically, and well, I think it's a mistake to make that assumption. Read the great books, then decide if man's collective philosophy has come to something more true now than it was at some previous time. The name Great Conversation is, in a sense, a misnomer in that a lot of it is a great argumentation. I'm skeptical of those who think we are so much smarter and wiser than those a hundred or a thousand years ago. Yes, we can build things they couldn't even dream of through our scientific advancement, but science doesn't answer the primary questions of philosophy and religion and our scientific advancement might not be indicative of a parallel advancement in philosophy or religion. Maybe there's even an inverse relationship. Maybe the further we go scientifically, the more we sacrifice wisdom and philosophical truth. Just a thought. Nonetheless, I'm a proud owner of the 1952 Great Books of the Western World set, and if you want to find out more about it and similar book sets, like the Franklin Library set, the Harvard Classic set, etc., Check out the various book lists I've put on thinkingwest.com. But for this podcast, I'm primarily going to be reading the editions in the Great Books of the Western World set, though any edition will do if you plan to read along. If you don't, no problem. Nothing I say apart from the occasional quote will be exclusive to any one edition of the work. What I love about the Great Books of the Western World set in particular, and its editors Hutchins and Adler, is that they provided a decade-long reading plan to read a mere subset of the books. This really highlights the scale of the work they put in. The set was framed as a sort of complete liberal education for a college-age student, and this reflects Hutchins and Adler's belief that the great books are the best way for education. I plan to go through just some of the works in ten years, a decade long of study. It's crazy. And Adler said in an interview once that a decade of reading is a mere minimum necessary to be moderately educated. In his opinion, of course. And then he expanded further, saying that even reading them once may not be enough. For you often truly don't grasp the depth and subtleties of a book until a second or third reading, depending on the work. 
So what Adler is really saying, and what I want to stress more than anything else, is that reading the great books is not a one-and-done thing. It's not a task to be checked off and completed, with a paper degree handed to you at the end of it. In reality, there is no end in a very practical way. There are always more great books to read. No, reading the great books is a habit. A lifestyle of continual learning. It will never end for as long as you live. And this is why making reading a habit is so crucial. It's the habit of reading that's the goal, not the reading of some set of books. Several years ago, I told myself I would read the Bible cover to cover. I read Genesis within a week or so, got halfway into Deuteronomy, and didn't open it up again for a very long time. I think several other people would have had a very similar experience, ending their reading of the Bible around Deuteronomy because of its, well, very boring nature for most of us. The problem was that I made reading the whole Bible the task, rather than reading two pages a day the task. The latter is a habit. Daily reading at a specified time. And that's what I've been doing now for the past year. Reading two pages of the Bible every morning, Monday through Friday. And now, well, I'm on track to finish by the end of the year. The important thing is that I framed my goal in terms of a daily habit. And that's what we need to do with any long-term goal. Break it down into small tasks that can be completed each and every day. This is the way to make reading the great books a lifestyle rather than a monumental and unachievable task. As I've said several times, reading the great books is not by any means easy. They include some of the most difficult and esoteric writing out there. Still worse, we aren't only limited by the ability of the writer to clearly convey their ideas, but in many cases how well a book's native language translates to our language, and the ability of the translator to preserve that meaning and style. Often our ideas of these great books come from a very bland stint with them in high school. But the reason I think they weren't interesting at the time for most of us is that we were vastly underprepared to tackle them. And these books were taught to us rather than given us to explore ourselves. That and their context was often never fully included, which I think is vital to understand many of the great books, as you'll see in other episodes. Knowing what was going on in Athens just before the trial of Socrates is vital to understanding Plato's famous work Apology. Be sure to check out the episode on that to get an idea of what I'm talking about. Susan Wise Bauer, author of The Well-Educated Mind That Set Me on Fire to Study the Great Books, writes, quote, Yet because we can read the newspaper or Time or Stephen King without difficulty, we tend to think that we should be able to go directly into Homer or Henry James without any further preparation. And when we stumble, grow confused, or wary, we take this as proof of our mental inadequacy. We'll never be able to read the great books. End quote. Her point is that the great books aren't something you're going to waltz into, most likely. And that's my goal for this show, that I can, through my reading and research, present to you a story with commentary and context built in. Guide you through the works, not as an expert per se, in an academic way, but as simply someone who reads the works alongside you and puts in some legwork to see what's going on in the world of the author that might draw out further meaning and clarity for the book. Additionally, I think most of us are generally short on time, and while listening to a show about a book will always be inferior to reading the book yourself, I'd rather have you engage with these great books in this way than not at all. Then there's a third purpose for the show, which is to serve as that third part of the trivium in a classical education, the rhetorical stage where we discuss the ideas, ask the bigger questions about the work, and generally put forth well-informed opinions about the work and its underlying philosophies. Now in this show, you and I don't really care about the book itself, meaning its form and its style, all the superficial things about the book. No, we care about two things, the story the book presents and what we can take away from it. So that's where Great Books Explored is focused, so that you get the best value per minute you possibly can while still allowing ample time to explore many of the interesting things offered by complex and nuanced books. Here we are focused on the content of the book, and building around that the context of the author and historical period. Be sure to join me in exploring the great books. Thanks for tuning in to the Great Books Explored podcast. If you enjoy the podcast and want to revive the great books and the great conversation in this crazy digital age, please consider supporting us at thinkingwest.com donate. 
We complain constantly about a stupid, lazy culture, ignorant of the better things in life and of all the richness of the philosophy and history that got us where we are today. In my own small way, I hope this podcast is in many ways counter-cultural and that it reverses some of the less pleasant aspects of our culture today. Help me do this by sharing this podcast everywhere and to everyone you can. Rate, subscribe, and leave a comment on what you think about the great books and the great conversation. But most importantly of all, read on. Thank you.